Greetings everybody, I trust you're well in these uncertain times. Over the next few minutes, I'll take you through this level six tutorial in general surgery. Okay, thank you for joining us. I think we're going to go through tutorial number three, which is hydrocephalus or hydrocephalus, depending on who you decided your colonizers are. This is a really interesting topic, uh, come to think of it. It's been described for many years by Hippocrates, by Galen, by many Arabic physicians. Uh, what's strange with the hydrocephalus is the disease hydrocephalus has been described longer than the advent or discovery of CSF. It's kind of funny to think that that hardly makes sense even now. But even regarding hydrocephalus, there's a lot that we know, but there's also so much that we don't know uh, since uh, its advent. And the treatment has largely stayed the same, but I'm sure over time things will evolve and change, and we'll see what's different. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Dr. M. A. Magoha. I'm, I'm a consultant neurological surgeon and lecturer at the University of Nairobi, and I'll uh, take you through this topic today. Thank you. So what are we going to go through today? We'll go through about six main things through this revision session. Uh, first, what is hydrocephalus? Uh, uh, the introduction. Two, how is CSF tied to hydrocephalus? Three, when do you qualify to have hydrocephalus? How does hydrocephalus affect the brain? And how do patients with hydrocephalus uh, present? And the last thing, what do you do when you have somebody who presents with hydrocephalus, which is the reason that you're here? The only reason that you're here learning all of this is to be better clinicians. So I'll take you through this introduction. It's uh, one of the most common diseases that you will see uh, worldwide. It's the most common neurologic disease, accounting for 0 0.3 to about 3 or 2 per 1,000 live births globally from different series. And that's not counting African series where we don't seem to have many registries. Uh, worldwide, it's reported about 50% of all pediatric surgical procedures. And uh, hydrocephalus.org says approximately 40,000 procedures are done annually. And if you calculate, that's about one procedure done every 15 minutes. So if you want to change the world, this is a place that you can. So how is CSF produced and how does it move? This is a pet question. Everywhere you go, everybody likes to ask this question. So you have to know it. So I'll start with a few things before I run through this down here on the side. So a couple of things, it's produced at about 0 0.2 to 0 0.4 uh, ml per minute. That gives you about 350 to 500 ml produced a day. And in the circulating volume, there's only about uh, 120 to 150. Some texts go out to about 250, depending on the physiologic characteristics, such as stress, ETC, at any one point in time. Only about 120 is in the ventricles, the rest could be spread out. So where is it produced? Simple. It's produced in the choroid plexus. Where is the choroid plexus? In the trigon mostly. And where is the trigon? In the lateral ventricles, as you can see here. So from the paired lateral ventricles, it goes through the paired foramina uh, of Monroe. From there, it goes to the slit-like third ventricle, which only has a cap of about 20 ml at any given point. And from there, it goes through the cerebral aqueduct of Sylvius. From there, it goes to the fourth ventricle that we have here, this beautiful uh, fourth ventricle. From the fourth ventricle, it goes to the paired foramina of Lushka and the single foramina of Magendi. And from there, it goes to the subarachnoid space and all of the systems that you can see all around here. You can see the prepontine cistern, cistern and magna over here, the ambient cistern, ETC. And from there, it goes, it goes all the way around and will be absorbed via arachnoid villi at the dural venous sinuses. From there, it enters the circulation. From circulation, it goes to the heart, gets aerated in the lungs, and joins arterial blood. From arterial blood, it goes on to the basolateral membrane of the choroid plexus, and then we start this period of ultrafiltration to go and form cerebrospinal fluid. All the details about what CSF does, all the functions of CSF, ETC, you've done before time and time again. I'm not going to disturb level six students for that. We'll just have a very short summary of what happens at the level of the choroid plexus, which I believe should be next. Okay, here we go. Now, this is production ac across the choroid plexus. Let's keep it very simple. It's I keep saying the word, it's the ultrafiltrate of the brain. That's why we have no lymphatics in the brain. This is what serves its function. So we have the capillary wall, basolateral membrane, epical membrane. Uh, this is the choroid plexus itself. The epical membrane, this will be the ventricular side. So what am I saying? Let me make it very, very simple. So 
The epithelial cells of the choroid plexus secrete CSF by a process which involves sodium, chloride, and bicarbonate from the blood to the ventricles of the brain. Simple. It's unidirectional transport and it's achieved due to polarity of the epithelium. So that means uh, ion transport proteins on the basolateral side that we showed you will have to be different from that on the apical side. The movement of ions creates an osmotic gradient which drives secretion of water. So there have been different methods to prove that this is hypothesis actually true. So there have been isotope flux studies, immunohistochemistry studies, in situ hybridization, RT-PCR, I mean, you can keep going on and on and on. But uh, all they do is they do tell you that there's expression of these iron transporters in the choroid plexus epithelium. Most of these transporters have been localized at specific membranes, for example, sodium potassium ATPase pump and potassium channels, and the sodium 2-chloride potassium co-transporters will be on the epical membrane, so that will be on the ventricular side. And by contrast, the basolateral membrane has chloride bicarbonate exchangers and variety of sodium coupled bicarbonate transporters. And then you have um, potassium chloride trans co-transporters that you can see there. You can also see aquaporin 1, which mediates transport of water across, eh, across, across the apical membrane. Uh, the route across the basolateral membrane is unknown to date, and there are about four or five different hypotheses, but I, I, I don't think this matters for our discussion. The only thing to note is carbonic anhydrase over here. Uh, which works in conjunction with these proteins, and we can uh, we can inhibit the function of carbonic anhydrase using different things like acetazolamide, and that will affect the production of CSF. So now that we know how CSF is produced, what is hydrocephalus? What's the big deal? So by definition, it's a hydrodynamic disorder of CSF resulting from disturbance of formation, flow, or absorption of CSF resulting in an increase in volume. So simply put, it's an increase in the volume of CSF through any which way. It could be production, it could be formation, uh, formation is production, it could be flow, or it could be absorption. Those three simple ways. Now, how do you classify? There are many different classification systems and some of them are cross-cutting. Does it really matter how you classify? Uh, well, not really. We normally classify so that we know what to do. But as you'll understand, hydrocephalus is evolving and things change. So uh, I only put uh, four simple classification systems here. And indeed, uh, uh, one disease entity of hydrocephalus can be in more than one. So the first one is acute versus chronic. Some texts even give you subacute. So this is sudden occurring in days versus prolonged increase in ICP. Uh, our definition of acute is within hours. Subacute is uh, within days. Chronic is within weeks to years of progression. Congenital versus acquired. When students never know what to say, you can always say congenital. <laughs> so this is contracted as at birth or after. The stereotypical example of after is post meningitis, and in our setup we have uh, we have TB meningitis, which is quite common. The other one, this is an old one, but I, I just have to say it for completeness. The name it has the name has changed depending on who you're speaking to. Older professors and lecturers still like to say this. This was based on imaging, but as I'll explain, when we go through, it's not really quite true anymore. It's communicating versus non-communicating. Nowadays, we call it intraventricular versus extraventricular hydrocephalus for reasons that I'll explain later. And then I lumped all of the other ones into others. These are other entities which fall under hydrocephalus but have completely different pathophysiologies. Uh, so things like normal pressure hydrocephalus and benign external hydrocephalus. I only focused on those two for today. The rest you'll see, you can read in your handout. So congenital versus acquired, as we said, uh, this is caused by fetal development, genetic anomalies. It may be syndromic, like associated with myelomeningocele when you talk about CARI2 malformation or neural, neural tube defects, or non-syndromic and things like hydrocephaly where you get failure of development of the brainstem. They can get acquired by many processes after birth, including interventricular bleeds, post-meningitic, could be after a tumor, ETC. Now, um, because everybody uses the word congenital hydrocephalus and it tends to, uh, to be honest, it irritates me, I'll, I'd like to put one stereotypical form of, con of true congenital hydrocephalus that we discovered recently. So you can have X-linked hydrocephalus, also known as L1 syndrome, the most common cause of genetic hydrocephalus, 
uh, affects 10% of boys with congenital hydrocephalus and common it's also a common cause of X-linked spastic paraplegia also known as SPG1 in boys. So L1 syndrome is caused by mutations in the neural cell adhesion molecule L1 cam the gene at the XQ28 position and compromises broad clinical spectrum of disorders including X-linked hydrocephalus Massa syndrome, which is mental retardation, adducted limbs, shuffling gait, aphasia, and spastic paraplegia type 1. So there's also a HSAS syndrome of X-linked hydrocephalus with stenosis of the aqueduct of Sylvius, which can begin prenatally and be found prenatally. This is a nice question to ask, a nice SAQ question, because it just reaffirms that congenital hydrocephalus is more significant than saying you couldn't find the cause. Now, uh, I talked about this communicating versus non-communicating. Now, ever since we called, uh, the old name of CSF was like a co Cotugni, because we didn't believe hydrocephal we didn't believe CSF was there, because if you think about it, prior to the advent of um, autopsy, um, all you had, all that you had to go on was live people and what you found in live people. And if you, if any of you have done a craniotomy, there's lots of bleeding. You, How would you distinguish just little fluid clear fluid from blood when you're cutting in the brain with an, in an archaic craniotomy. So people didn't think I, um, CSF actually existed for quite some time. And then there was there was um, Kochugni who came later and identified CSF and this gentleman, I, I forget, is it Quinky who the first person to do the lumbar puncture who confirmed the function and communication of hydrocephalus. Now based on that, after many years of imaging, we decided that the two entities which everybody loves, which are communicating hydrocephalus and non-communicating hydrocephalus. Now these are based on imaging characteristics, but they're not strictly true. One of the causes of communicating hydrocephalus would be meningitis, and how meningitis causes communicating hydrocephalus is it forms very thick um, adhesions with arachnoiditis or thick exudates, which we don't see on conventional imaging on CT scan, ETC. But in surgery, you do notice that there is some thick protein or exudate which you can see. You can also see it on endoscopy sometimes, so it's not a true communicating hydrocephalus. Now, based on this and many other reasons, the nomenclature has changed to ventricular hydrocephalus or extraventricular hydrocephalus, which, as the name suggests, it means something within the ventricle or something from outside the ventricle causing the issue. But uh, um, still, this is changing and uh, different books move at different levels and your pathology books still talk about this, so I'll still tell you about communicating hydrocephalus. So communicating hydrocephalus, as I said, on imaging, there's full communication between the ventricles and subarachnoid spaces. So some of the causes which are uh, talked about is overproduction of CSF. And as we said, CSF is produced by the choroid uh, plexus. So simply put, what could cause the choroid plexus to produce more? Well, the choroid plexus itself could become bigger, and it could become bigger in a benign way or a malignant way. So that would be choroid plexus carcinoma and papillomas. Choroid plexus carcinomas are very rare, less than 1% of all SOLs, so they are quite rare. SOLs in themselves are rare compared to other uh, tumors. Then you could have defective absorption of CSF. That we said different things like meningitis can cause this. And then you can get uh, things like venous drainage insufficiency. So those are causes of communicating hydrocephalus. Let's go to the easy one, uh, which you can figure out is non-communicating hydrocephalus. So CSF flow is obstructed within the ventricular system or in its outlets of the arachnoid space resulting in impaired CSF uh, from the ventricle to subarachnoid space. Commonest cause would be, of course, a tumor, any type of brain tumor. Pick the one you like and drop it right there, which will disrupt the ventricular anatomy. If you're stuck, just pick up a stereo fossa tumor because the stereo fossa is a small space and it'll interrupt your cerebral aqueduct or fourth ventricle resulting in hydrocephalus. So this is just a list of some of the ones. It's by no means an exhaustive list. You can go and look for many of them. But I'd like to say, uh, call it Magoha's rule, just say three things. If you can explain those three things well, then you're, then you're doing well. So uh, communicating, three of them, congenital, acquired, and over secretion. So congenital Chiari malformation. Uh, those of you who are keen students of neurology or neurosurgery know that there are five types of Chiari malformations. Do you need to know all of them? No. But the principle is this. You get different levels, varying levels of caudal descent of the medulla and cerebellar tonsils. And that in itself causes an obstruction. 
uh, at the base of the skull. I think I have an image yet for you to go through. Other things like encephalocele or leptomeningeal inflammation. Encephalocele, you just get a change in the architecture itself, and you get change in flow and different forms of currents, and that does it, that causes hydrocephalus over a long period of time. The incidence of uh, hydrocephalus with encephalocele varies depending on the type, uh, and uh, you can use the what's, what's it, what is it called? The Suanella and Suanella classification of encephalocils, but that's not for today's discussion. Uh, occipital encephalocils have a higher risk of developing hydrocephalus than other encephalocils. I think that's enough for this level. Now we had leptomeningeal inflammation. You'd get things like arachnoid scarring, so you don't have flow of CSF through the arachnoid space, which will cause an accumulation over time. You'll also get deposits in the arachnoid uh, granulations. Then you have lysencephaly, a congenital absence of arachnoid granulations, that one you can figure out. Other acquired conditions would be infections, I've already said, hemorrhage, blood itself can block, particulate matter, almost the same as infections, tumors, platybasia. Platybasia means flattening of the base of the skull, if you literally translate it. So with flattening of the base of the skull, you don't get good flow uh, of CSF, and you can get things like whirls and eddy currents, so you don't get flow going across the the um, uh, systems, and I already spoke about the uh, secretion of CSF, called plexus papilloma. Non-communicating, non even if you guess, you'll be okay. So you can get aqueductal obstruction or stenosis. The, um, some, something nice to know is that the Tuskegee exper experiments uh, showed that this is one of the sequelae of long-term infection with syphilis. So that, that's nice to know. Next, you can get atresia of foramina of Lushka or Majendi. You can get a Dandy Walker cyst, which also causes eddy currents and you don't get flow across the cisterns. Masses, any tumor, any vascular malformation, or benign intracranial cysts. Then you can get acquired aqueductal stenosis, like after glyosis, like I told you with the Tuskegee experiments. Ventricular inflammation, ventriculitis, scars, and tumors. Now, this is a T1 weighted MRI scan of a, looks like a young child. And what we do have here, we have, let me look at it quickly. Uh, what we look at here, we have aqueductal stenosis because I do not see the aqueduct in itself. So first, let's start. There is evidence of hydrocephalus because you can see these la large lateral ventricles here. If we measure the Evans ratio, we'll see that it's more than two thirds quite clearly. Next, we have one of the pathognomonic signs of hydrocephalus. Looks like Mickey Mouse, if you like Disney. So this is known as the Mickey Mouse sign. This is normally typical when there's a distal obstruction of the third ventricle, because the third ventricle should be slit-like. And here, indeed, if you look at this sagittal view, we do not see the aqueductal sylvius, though we do see the fourth ventricle here. But it looks like there is collateral flow, because it looks like Everything is moving around these systems to try and have some semblance of flow. So this is uh, non-communicating hydrocephalus. Okay, here, let's look at this. Ah, oh, here it's labeled, so, ah, this is quite easy. So here we have hydrocephalus again, and as we look here, you can see the lateral ventricles are quite dilated. We don't see the normal architecture here. We don't see the corpus callosum, so it must have been pushed up. Yeah, even though we should look at the corpus callosum on this image, if any radiologist is looking. What you can see here, this arrow, we have so many features of a Chiari malformation. This looks like a Chiari 2 malformation, because there's caudal descent of the medulla, plus the cerebellar tonsils, and all of the other signs that we have here. So this would um, be classified the, in the old way as a communicating hydrocephalus, because all the ventricular systems are communicating. Uh, indeed, we, do, we don't have a good adequate cut here to show us the aqueduct, but with this pathology, then we know it's a form of communicating hydrocephalus. All right, next we go to, ah, yes, now we go to some of the important mimics. There are very many of them, but I think let's just stick with two so that you don't get overwhelmed. So we have benign external hydrocephalus. So this is benign enla enlargement of the subarachnoid spaces in infancy. It is self limiting. I say again, it is self-limiting. So we don't need to put this child through any harmful surgical procedure. So with this, you have an absorption deficiency of infancy and early childhood, which is also in a mildly raised ICP, an enlargement of the subarachnoid spaces. 
The ventricles are usually not enlarged significantly and you get resolution between one year most of the time. This is because sometimes you might get a, a bulging anterior fontanelle in a child whose head seems slightly large and on imaging you see something that looks like this. So if you see this, this is benign external hydrocephalus. If you didn't get the idea from the name, it is benign. Here is another one. This is one to keep and to please remember in your practice when you finish next year, normal pressure hydrocephalus. So with this, you get hydrocephalus with the absence of papilloedema. If you do a lumbar puncture, you'll get normal CSF opening pressure and it tends to affect elderly patients above 60 years. Why does it happen? We don't know why it happens at all. There are a couple of theories. There's a theory which comes from, the, I believe, what is it the 40s or 60s? I forget which decade but from the same Hakim of the Hakim stride. I believe it's Hakim and Arthur who, have, who hypothesize that you get slow decreased absorption over a long period of time and you achieve a new homeostasis with an increased base, baseline of ICP. So the classic Hakim stride is gait apraxia, incontinence, and, dimension, and hey, dimen dementia. This dementia is uh, sometimes reversible, and I like this because it's known as a reversible cause of dementia and indeed I've seen a couple of patients of mine who presented confused and with a ventricular peritoneal shunt they revert back to themselves it's very satisfying uh, for the family and for the surgeons involved treatment repeat high volume lumbar functions but uh, that of course has its own issues fetazolamide has worked in some cases and ventricular peritoneal shunting uh, seems to work this is a very nice cartoon that I found on the internet when I was looking around. I'd like to commend this Jorge Muniz who, who drew this. So this is a nice summary of everything. An elderly male who presents with dementia, slightly increased elevated CSF as you can see here. Treatment is a uh, lumbar peritoneal shunt and you can see they have a magnetic gate with these little magnets, urinary incontinence and dementia. Okay, let's go to pathophysiology of hydrocephalus. So, what happens? And this is what tends to happen. Oh, okay, there's something going on in my computer. All right, no, okay. So there are about five steps that I summarized. So one, you get uh, intracranial pressure is increased when production is more than absorption. That's the commonest reason, but there are other reasons that we said. So the increased CSF will result in increased venous sinus pressure, and then, when that happens, you'll get CSF production, which will continue to decrease transiently as in ICP increases. As that continues, as these three steps continue, they don't have to uh, happen in order. What you start to get is a compensation mechanism, and the compensation will occur via the transventricular absorption and root nerve sleeves. And what that happens, you'll get temporal horn dilatation. The temporal horns are supposed to be very small. They're not supposed to dilate. They're less than two millimeters. And what happens is they dilate first, then they move to the frontal horns, which results in elevation of the corpus callosum, as we saw in that scan. And you get rupture of the septum pellucidum, which is the thin lining in between. And then you get thinning of the cerebral mantle and enlargement of the third uh, ventricle. The magnitude of thinning of the cerebral mantle lets you know whether or not it's severe or not severe hydrocephalus. And that has implications in follow-up of these patients. Now, clinical features of hydrocephalus. Uh, before we continue, clinical features of hydrocephalus, uh, as you've seen, there are very many causes. It depends, one, the time of presentation, age of the patient, whether or not it's acute or chronic hydrocephalus. And with this, you divide into three main groups. So uh, they are going to be um, infants, uh, young children, and adults. By infants, I mean anybody below the age of 18 years before the sutures have closed. Those above, uh, sorry, 18 months, I know before the sutures have closed. Those older than 18 months where the sutures have closed, but their brain is still developing. And those who the brain have developed, and now they develop hydrocephalus. As far as I'm concerned, I only focused largely on infants, because if we're able to identify an infant, you can prevent many of the complications, as we see. So let's put it very simple. Uh, infants and neonates can't tell you what's going on. And so this is what you see, irritability, inconsolable crying, a high-pitched cry, once you hear, you'll never forget it. Reduced activity, a listless child, not moving, not reacting to external stimuli. Poor feeding, number one sign that there's something wrong in an infant is refusal to feed. 
And of course, the one that brings them to us, and I put it here last intentionally, is increase in head size. We shouldn't see an increase in head size. Though that being said, in the Well Baby Clinic, the one of the definitions of hydrocephalus is an enlarged head, more than two standard deviations of the normal for more than two months uh, continuous. Then once you, you have those symptoms, you have to have signs. So next is head enlargement, more than the 98th percentile, like I said, more than two standard deviations. When you feel the sutures, you'll get sutural diastasis. If you look at this child, there'll be dilated scalp veins. The anterior fontanelle here will be tense and bulging. If it's pressing on the midbrain, you'll get the setting sun sign, which is an upward gaze palsy, and you get increased uh, limb tone with that. Um, um, if you allow me to, let me go through some of the features of uh, children. With the children who would be slight old, slightly older, the symptoms would be, let's go through this, slowing of mental capacity, headaches, because they can complain of headaches. They might get neck pain, uh, blurring of vision, double vision, stunted growth. If it progresses, they could get difficulty in walking, uh, drowsiness, and there would be, uh, uh, for lack of a better word, slow in school. The signs would be signs of raised ICP, so papillary edema, failure of upward gaze, which would still be the same. If it's been going on for, wrong, uh, for long and they're thinning of the skull, if you percuss the skull, you'll get Macowan sign, which is a cracked pot sign. They'd have a large head and they could have a six nerve palsy from stretching of the nerve. Uh, the one that comes in after that would be adults. Adults are, are a bit hard to get. Most people miss adults, you need to have a strong index of suspicion. So they'd have cognitive deterioration over time, headaches, neck pain, nausea, blurring of vision, double vision. If it keeps on progressing, they'd have difficulty walking, drowsiness and incontinence. Kind of like your normal pressure hydrocephalus. Keep in mind, those are chronic hydrocephalus. When you examine, they have signs of raised intracranial pressure, so papillary edema, failure of upward gaze again, as we said, a unilateral gait. And if this has been happening since before childhood, they might have macrocephaly, but you have to have a keen index of suspicion. So next we go to investigations. Uh, investigations have really changed over the years. Uh, um, I would say locally in our country, internationally maybe not so much. So before they used to say the standard of care was um, an ultrasound for diagnosis of hydrocephalus. Well, that is true, but there is a caveat. This can be done in the emergency setup or in the preterm to diagnose hydrocephalus and what you get here is a dilated lateral ventricles, temporal horns, and the third ventricle here. And then you can see this side projection as well. The issue with the ultrasound is it's always user dependent. The next thing is you might be able to diagnose hydrocephalus, but you might not be able to diagnose the cause of hydrocephalus. So with that, I want to show something which might be contentious, but it is the real reality that we have is CT scans. Now, CT scans are a bit scary, especially in children because the normal amount of, depending on the protocol, the amount of radiation is 1 to 10 millisieverts. And what research has shown is that with 1 to 10 millisieverts uh, exposure to the child, you normally get a, there's a risk of development of leukemia or lymphoma of a 1 in, there's a 1 in 1,000 chance over 10 years. I believe the protocols have changed since that landmark study. I think I'll put a link to the study and send it also to the class rep. So we tend to avoid uh, CT scans where possible. The imaging modality of choice is going to be an MRI. The issue that we have locally is number one, MRIs are not available everywhere. Two, the second issue with uh, doing MRI imaging for infants and neonates is that you need anesthetists and anesthesia. And locally, anesthesia, anesthetists might not be available in every facility that you'll go to, especially those of you who might go to district uh, facilities. So with that, and you're not you're faced with making a decision, do a CT scan in the emergency setup. So with a CT scan, this is what you'd get. These are very dilated temporal horns, which you're not supposed to see at all. Uh, as I said, the, uh, the usual uh, spatial resolution of a CT scan is about five millimeters, and the size of the temporal horn should be about two millimeters. So when the temporal horns are dilated, then you see them. So if you see them, you need to start suspecting that there might be a hydrocephalus. From there, you look at the deltation of the lateral ventricles, which we see here. Next, you can get the biparietal diameter and calculate something we call the Evans ratio, that we can see here. Again, we have the Mickey Mouse sign here, 
uh, showing that uh, there is um, a blockage distal to the third ventricle. Uh, a simple algorithm is once you see hydrocephalus, next is look for the cause of the hydrocephalus. Sometimes you might not get. And then this is the third image higher up. Here we can see the cortical mantle is less than one centimeter. So with this, we can classify this child as having severe hydrocephalus. Severe hydrocephalus has uh, implications with things like cognitive decline, uh, etc. Next. Ah, good. Now this is an MRI. Uh, this is MRI of choice. I believe this is off the internet. This is not one of mine. But this is to illustrate to you that MRI can show you multiple things that the others might miss. With the ultrasound, you might have just got hydrocephalus, dilatation of the temporal horns, but you didn't know the cause. With this, you can see here, on this T1-weighted image, you can see something here which looks like a complex cyst at the area of the cellar region. On T2, you can see it, you know, it cleanly here. And over here, on this lateral view, you can see it looks like a complex cyst. This looks like a craniopharyngioma, which is uh, going and invading the third ventricle. And that's important because as opposed to just shunting this child and moving on, we would have to make a plan as to approach and to tackle this tumor in the first place. So don't all, so do not leave a child with diagnosis of hydrocephalus with an ultrasound alone and shunt them alone. Uh, that would be criminal. You need to look for the cause of the hydrocephalus. What I like uh, telling undergraduates, saying hydrocephalus is like saying anemia. It's not a diagnosis on its own. It does tell you that there's something you have to do, but you need to look for the cause. Now, uh, management. Let's make it very simple, because this we can keep droning on and on and on. So management, I'd put it into three main pillars. Supportive management, and then shunting procedures, and other operative procedures. So supportive management, this is just to decrease secretion of CSF and to try and manage the increased intracranial pressure. So this, you give drugs which... In, um, decrease production of CSF. And the only one that I know that really works is acetazolamide. Some books talk about furosemide, but I, I like to stay away from furosemide, especially in, in infants and neonates, because the other risk we have would be electrolyte anomalies and uh, dehydration. And as you know, with infants, dehydration kills. Next, the shunting procedures will make it very simple. This is an undergraduate lecture, so I won't go through these in detail. We just need to know at least ventriculoperitoneal shunting. Other shunting procedures exist. Uh, I'll just say only two others, ventriculoatrial and ventriculoplural. These two are rarely done unless the, for some reason the peritoneum is not available to us. So in very select cases, it's just good to know that they exist. The next in other operative procedures, uh, endoscopic third ventriculostomy. This, I, this has taken over uh, ventriculoperitoneal shunting in selected cases. And this is the norm in many facilities, and indeed at Kansas National Hospital. When available, many of our children go to, through endoscopic third ventriculostomy. Put it simply, wouldn't you rather a simple procedure that makes one physiological versus leaving somebody with some piece of hardware for the rest of their life in their body? The other one, this is contentious. Uh, I think there's only one study by Ben Wolf that showed its use, choroid flexectomy. In my own experience, it doesn't seem to yield much value. So I just put it here for completeness sake. And of course, like the scan we just showed you, if you remove the cause like the tumor, that will treat the hydrocephalus. So craniotomy for tumor, that's simple. Now this is, ah, okay. This is just to show you what ventriculoperitoneal shunting is so that you can plan and think about it. So what happens is we get a catheter, a celastic catheter, and what we do is we get our ventricular end and we put it through the ventricle. There are many points you can put it in. At Keen's point, you can put it at the frontal point. You can go through a Fraser bubble. Uh, but in undergraduate, I don't think you can in undergraduate. And through that, you come and connect to a valve. This valve will be the high pressure, low pressure, or medium pressure to prevent a siphoning effect. So every time you breathe and your abdomen moves, you pull and you create negative pressure, which can always also suck and cause overdrainage. From there, we do subcutaneous tunneling, and subcutaneous tunneling comes through the midline. In women, we try and avoid the breasts or the mammary, mammary glands, and we come and we put it right into the peritoneal cavity, and uh, patients who have ventricular peritoneal shunting have shunts for life. So this is not a small procedure. It's, it might be easy to do. It can be done in less than 30 minutes, but you have changed the patient's uh, life forever by giving them this piece of hardware. So that's what ventricular peritoneal shunting is. 
Next, ah, next we have um, this is showing endoscopic third ventriculostomy. So what we do is we come and we drill a. Oh no, this picture is not the best picture for endoscopic third ventriculostomy. That is, that is my mistake. I do apologize. Uh, it's, I, no, actually, I think the issue is the artist put the suture at the wrong place. So what what happens is we drill a hole normally behind the suture line, so that before we miss the eloquent cortex of the the eloquent motor cortex. And with that, we put our endoscope. And with the endoscope, we go to the floor of the third ventricle and we make a hole right here so that it can communicate with the interpeduncular system and CSF can flow quickly. What this is showing is showing two different ways. So this looks like this is um, axial endoscopy. Axial just means that all of the instruments are within the scope itself. And this, you can also biopsy the posterior and you can also go, it looks like this, this might have been a brainstem tumor that somebody was trying to biopsy from this image. Yeah. So with that, it's a quick, simple procedure. The hole itself might close if the case is not selected properly, if the patient is too young, if there's things like adhesive arachnoiditis. But the beauty with this procedure is that you can always repeat the procedure. Now, complications. Um, there are three types of complications. I would say surgical, according to, uh, to surgical treatment, medical treatment, and natural history of the disease. Since we've just talked about uh, uh, surgery, let's talk about some complications related to surgery itself. So the first is shunt collapse, infection, failure, complications such as peritonitis. And indeed, we've had a case of, of um, an appendicular abscess after uh, pre, uh, ventricular peritoneal shunting that we reported from our facility, quite rare, I think uh, reported by Professor Mwangombe. Things like inguinal hernias, perforations, volvulus, CSF ascites from overdrainage. Shunts can also act as conduits for extraneural metastasis of certain tumors. Uh, that's common sense. If you have, you're communicating two distinct body cavities so things can spread. Next, uh, causative organisms for shunt infections. Of course, the skin will come first, so staph epidermidis, staph aureus, and then gram-negative rods from the abdomen, and then rare things like propionobacterium, acne, etc. Now, of course, since you have this hardware going directly into the ventricles, then there's high morbidity and mortality seen with gram-negative infections if you put them in the wrong place. As we spoke with uh, on the presentation in abscesses, remember the gram-negative, with gram-negatives, the cell wall itself is uh, antigenic. Think now, then we have things, of course, of overshunting. This will be problems with the valve. Things like subdural hematoma and intracranial hypotension. Next, uh, we have related to progression of the disease. So if you don't treat what will happen to them, they'll get visual changes, chronic papilloedema, injuring of the optic disc because you're compressing all of the venous structures, getting increased uh, venous pressure and then decreased arterial pressure. Then you get dilatation of the third ventricle, which also compresses the optic chasm. Then you get cognitive dysfunction due to stretching and tearing of the neural fibers, thing of the corpus callosum. You get structural changes in myelination and damage of brain tissues. That's if it continues over time. And if I remember correctly, pathology books used to say if this continues for over six weeks. Then related to medical management, especially in children, I told you electrolyte imbalances and dehydration. This image on the right is a case report I got from the internet uh, of a child who presented with the shunt extruding out of the mouth. I have seen this myself, or mostly with children with HIV. I do not know the relation. I've seen one with the extruding through the anus, and I've seen an infant with the same presentation. What's interesting with this child is this child seems to be in fairly good condition despite a large shunt coming through his mouth. Uh, with that, thank you for your attention. Um, you can get my latest book on Amazon Kindle or on, in selected stores or at the University Bookstore. If you have any questions, you can get me on my email, university email here. And with that, thank you for your time. Uh, have a blessed day.